الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. So now we are continuing in the life of Omar رضي الله تعالى عنه. Al Faruq. Al Faruq. Anybody know what Al Faruq means? Al Faruq. What does this mean? Huh? Huh? Okay. He said, do you know how to translate that one, Yazid? Al Fasl Bain Al Haqi Wal Batil? Well, the one who separates right from the wrong. So I'm talking about one of our. Proud students of the Friday night program, alhamdulillah. The one who differentiates or separates between truth and falsehood. So today that's what we're going to talk about. The development of Umar. The fundamentals and foundations as they are built in his life. And what changed him from a noble in the terms of a polytheistic uh, superstition based society of corrupt values. Uh, in which people would support tribe. Um, over everything else and morals took a second to the tribe in the uh, value system of Omar beforehand so if it came to uh, an issue if I have to support my tribe I will support my tribe before anybody else's <coughs> right who's not in my tribe right so there was lots of issues in uh, the polytheistic uh, Quraysh Meccan society that Omar was seen as a respected person in Today we're going to talk about how he became a pure monotheist with a very dedicated, devoted, pious lifestyle and focus in his life. So this is a very interesting transition. So we started with Al Faruq. He is the one that is the uh, the criterion, the one who truth and falsehood are made clear by being in his presence. You know which one is falsehood, and you know which one is truth. And you, you see the right decision as a practical reality. That was the life that Omar got used to leading after this. How did he get this nickname? Basically, Omar, he was talking to the Prophet Sallallahu the short time, then maybe the next day after he embraced Islam. He says, why are we sneaking around hiding our faith? And the Prophet ﷺ said, well, so unfortunately, there's a lot of people that have problems with us. He said, but aren't we on the truth? Are we following the truth? He says, yes, we're following the truth, for sure. He said, so why can't we go out and tell the people? And he said, Omar, if you want to go out and tell the people, go, out, go ahead and tell the people. Anybody who wants to go tell the people, go ahead and tell the people. So the Prophet ﷺ is giving credence to Omar's idea of standing up for what you believe. This was for the previous six years, not, it was just a family issue. Trying to call people that I know, my close friends and family, and build some relationship and try to show them the light of faith uh, through the Holy Quran. So now Omar starts into this idea. Let's take me and Hamza, let's take some Muslims and let's go walk around the Kaaba saying La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Subhanallah, Allahu Akbar and all of this. And so they went, and they did it, and people tried to stare and mock, but nobody did anything to them. So they made their circulation <coughs> around the Kaaba, and they prayed, and then they left. Then the Prophet ﷺ named him Al Faruq. So this is like a huge pivotal point in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, in his call to uh, prophethood. So before that, there was very, very difficult circumstances that they were facing. They had a very, very hard time just being Muslim, right? And so Omar's embracing of Islam basically brought this new dignity, this new high morale, this new uh, courage to stand up and be Muslim in front of everyone, not just in front of those directly related to you. So. There is a narration that is mentioned in Ibn Majah that basically uh, some scholars said weak, some scholars said it's uh, acceptable, Hassan. And it says that the angel Gabriel came down to the Prophet ﷺ after Omar started his mission and he said, Istabshara ahlu sama bi Islami Umar. That the angels in heaven have become happy giving glad tidings to the other people on the earth that Omar has become Muslim. This is a huge testimony. This is a testimony above uh, seven heavens. So this is 
this is the uh, reality of the change. It's something with huge impact. Now, how many of you remember Omar when he was young? How, what was his reality? Uh, what was his focus? What did his parents get him involved in? Huh? Yes. He was one of the few handful of young men who were sent with the poets to learn reading, writing, and poetic language. This would now tell you a certain proof of Islam in the fact that Omar became Muslim. Omar is very comfortable as a respected man of Mecca. Very comfortable. And he's very comfortable as a trained linguist in the literate arts of the Arabic language. So as we remember, what was the last thing that pushed him over the edge to go ahead and embrace Islam? What was it? Reading Surah Taha. So it was reading some Quran and he said to them, what did he say? What did he say to um, his uh, sister Fatima and his brother-in-law Saeed and Khabbab and these people? He said, the author of this, no one should be worshipped beside him. What is he saying? That this message, this usage of language to get into the heart <coughs> is very, very um, above human capacity. Something amazing. So a lot of people say that uh, they have a hard time understanding how a book can be a miracle. You wrote a book? There's actually, unfortunately, Arab uh, men, secular people, that studied the Arabic language, Taha Hussein and others, and they said, yeah, it's just a book, the Egyptian guy. He said, it's just a book. Yeah, I can call this a book and say it's a miracle. How do you know if it's a miracle or not? So I wrote a book, right? But Omar, number one, what it means for him, identity-wise and comfort level-wise, to leave the way of his forefathers and the nobility of the conservative nature of his values that he's grown up with and heard about for the previous generations, to go against that and his stature of the Arabic language. So him embracing this as God's words is a testimony to it being something. So maybe you don't know the Arabic language, or maybe you know the Arabic language, and you don't have a high capacity to understand the science of balagha, right? Eloquence of usage of language. Um, and so we're not just talking about a nice, beautiful poem with interesting styles of language. We're talking about a style of language that is high of a literary nature that gets into your heart that gets into your heart and moves you to action, that convinces you of how to live your life just because of its message. So Omar, he tasted that. So the beginning of Omar's change was, Omar has something good in his heart. He has empathy. He has compassion. He started looking at uh, some of these uh, sisters and you know what they went through and the torture and the abuse, and then they had to go migrate to uh, Abyssinia. And then he talked with them, and they said, we're not going to give up. So he felt bad for what these people have gone through, with it, which is a <coughs> compassionate, it is Rahmah. And God is Rahmah, that is his nature. He is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, right? And the Prophet Sallallahu his message is about Rahmah. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً الْعَالَمِينَ The only purpose for which you were sent is to be an act of mercy to all, right? So he has that in his heart. Thus he is deserving of guidance but when he read the quran that's whenever he was moved he was highly moved to follow this message at that point now after this omar he starts to proclaim his faith to any and everyone he doesn't care whether they want to listen or not somebody might take note and say that doesn't sound like wisdom but omar is a special person he's a special person with a special level and uh, de he demands a certain respect from the people who know him, right? So this is the Omar from before, but he's just changed his values, you see? And so he goes to people sitting in circles telling them about Islam. And on many occasions, groups of people would get angry and start yelling at him, and he would tell them what of it, and there would be a fight. It says, until the people became hopeless. We cannot influence Omar, and he just beats us every time we try to uh, fight him. So... There is this big concern happening in Arabia. 
So now what does Omar do after he embraced Islam and after he's, how does he grow as a Muslim? How does he become al Farooq? That's the question you should be asking because everyone here should think to themselves, I have lots of spiritual work to, to do on myself. What do I need to do to become on that higher level? How do I raise myself? How do I learn the ways of being a more righteous person? Right? So the first step is he used to go to Dar al-Arqam. He used to go to the house of Arqam ibn Arqam, which is where the Prophet ﷺ and the companions used to visit. So they used to go and they had fellowship, they had brotherhood, they got to know, they had sisterhood, sisters went there as well. And they used to get to know each other, and they learned the Qur'an, and they soaked up in the religion in a deep way, asking the Prophet ﷺ questions about this revelation and what it means and how it should affect our lives. And so he's taking that jama'ah, the brotherhood, and ilm, knowledge. And so he's focusing on that daily, daily. And I can tell you in my own experience, before I was Muslim, I had many, many issues in my values, and my lifestyle, in my uh, hopes, and what I feel is what I'm going to do in life, and all of these things, right? I did not become a great Muslim because I became aware of certain values. I was reading those values. And if you would have told me before Islam, should you probably pray a lot every day if you want to be a person of God? Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, should you be honest and kind and fair and all of this? Yeah, that sounds good. That makes sense, right? So it isn't just being aware of values. Being able to say those are the right values does not make you a good Muslim. That's not the difference, right? It's dedication to the cause. So when I found myself regularly attending a mosque, and I found that that group at that mosque, Alhamdulillah, and the praise is Allah's, that they welcomed me. And they were uh, encouraging me. And they were not judging me and attacking me and all of these things, right? They were, I was being welcomed into the place. So I'm seeking some knowledge, going to the library, listening to lectures, hadith after salah, whatever it is. And I'm visiting with these brothers and going to their houses and getting to know people who are very serious about God and religion. So that's really where the change took place in me, and that's exactly what happened here with Omar. So the Meccan period is all about building a foundation. You cannot have Medina without Mecca. And I'm talking in context of chronological order. So it cannot have an Islamic state with this deep divine law of comprehensive structural systematic function without building the hearts and understanding the priorities of character, belief, priorities of values and application of my belief and my creed. This is the first step, right? So Mecca versus Medina is a very, very interesting point, right? And we have to understand that in our context. So I'm going to uh, ask you a question. Right now, here we're living in America, many scholars would say, across the Muslim world, are we similar to the situation it was in Mecca, where people are still new to Islam, they don't really understand, they're still struggling with the influence of a very corrupt, un-Islamic culture and lifestyle, and they're just trying to get their heart right and build their foundations? Or are we where there's this great pious leader, with all these great, very well-trained leaders under his uh, umbrella, with this brilliance of moral character and greatness, and this system and law and societal um, function of Islam. Which one is it? Number one or number two? We're living in a Meccan reality. But you see some people, they function as though that they, they think and they interact as though this is a Medinan society, right? So I, you know, for example, I was saying before, I was talking with one of the other people here in the community, and I said, this thing where a sister who's not at that spiritual level, for example, to wear hijab, right? And she is interested in coming to the mosque to learn. She wants, she, her purpose of coming to the mosque is to pray and to learn and make friends with other sisters. But because we have this attitude of shunning and judging towards that sister who wants spirituality, right? then she doesn't come. Or she comes, but she feels forced to put on a hijab when she's not. That's not her choice, but it's more of a forced thing upon her. Now, this is hindering a growth process that should come naturally, right? In Mecca, there was no such thing as hijab. 
don't let shaitan fool you because oftentimes people listen to what I say and shaitan fools them. I'm not saying right now that hijab is not an obligation in our society. Move that from your mind. We're learning as we go here. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is <laughs> that as our reality is, some people aren't ready for that and they're not on that level of practice of Islam, which is still an obligation and always will be because it's been revealed, right? We need to be easier. And this goes to kids as well. This goes to how we deal with kids and how we talk to kids. Um, I, I know of a kid in Oklahoma that stopped coming to the mosque because one day he wore long shorts, long shorts, and they were halal shorts, as I know Islamic law now. And everybody was like, oh, astaghfirullah, those American shorts that you're wearing. Right? In Islamic law, he's actually fine, right? But the Muslim judgmental culture, haram police, it wasn't working out for him. And he got very alienated. This is the problem. So we need to help people, we need to facilitate for people a means. So was there any detailed Islamic laws in Mecca? None at all. Prayers just got started towards the end in a more comprehensive way. Um, fasting was not an obligation in Ramadan yet. There's no zakat, there's no hijab. There's, there's just basically stay away from these major sins. And believe, have, build your heart and believe things, right? So this is, what, this is how the foundation is built. Slowly but surely. They call it a tadarruj fit tashriya. Phases and stages of growing in the legislation of Islamic teachings. It starts with aqidah and akhlaq, character. That it says, يُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ First is tazkiyah. Before the rules and regulations and pushing those things on people, is that they are purified. First, you purify by your mind and your heart, get the right understanding of life and priorities. Then your outward character starts to develop because that's becoming your system. You're able to replace whatever corruption you've been surrounded with or influenced by with this correct understanding, right? Then after that, the law is there to complement and structure and fulfill uh, the life of a person. So what is this transformation? It was first from polythe polytheism to pure monotheism. So what that meant for Umar was... God and uh, divine reality was something, it was very hokey. And just throwing it around like it's, you know, the, the new day of the week. The new flavor of ice cream, you know. So, okay, that God, this God, the other God, worshipping this, worshipping that. And he knows, <laughs> these didn't create anything, right? So pure monotheism dictates... All your love, devotion, compassion, everything is rooted in a desire and a yearning to be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the first step. The second step is in recognizing the reality of human beings. Nobody in Mecca knows about Adam and Eve and Satan and that interaction and then the perpetual reality of Satan. One of the first surahs to be revealed that was quite consequential was قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ and قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ So often were these said, so integral were these surahs that Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu later mistakenly swore that those aren't part of the Qur'an. He said those are du'as, right? Because he just saw them as some very important du'as we say every single day, all day, many times. Why? Because... The people have to, re if you don't know your enemy, he will get the best of you, for sure. If you're not aware of your enemy, and you don't see his attack, you, he will get the best of you. He will trick you into something. This is for sure, right? So we have to know our enemy and the means and the methods. What is the best way to do that? Other, لا أقسمو بيوم القيامة ولا أقسمو بالنفس اللوامة This was revealed in Mecca. So it basically said, Beware, the reality is, I swear by the day that you will be accounted. And I swear by the self that takes account of itself. Omar is hearing this. Other companions are hearing this. And they're seeing, I need to start questioning myself, what I think, what I understand, what I'm going to do, what I'm going to say, and why. And what that might affect. How, what, what, might that, what might happen. 
And As believers, we have to talk to each other to help understand truth, help understand patience, help each other to understand our shortcomings and so forth, right? So there was jama'ah. They're hearing all of this. Ta'awanu al birri wa taqwa. Interact with each other on righteousness and piety. Do not interact on sin and enmity and transgression. Don't interact with people on those things. So these are foundational concepts. Now somebody might say, man, this is all concepts. I came for a cool story about the seerah, right? But the, the concepts is what makes the people of the seerah who they are. You see what I'm saying? I know we feel like we're being given one, two, three, A, B, C, uh, Roman numeral one, and an outline of character traits and quality and what it means. But those are the things that made all those great stories what they were because of how they affected the people, right? We have to approach Islam as a yearning desire for self-development, not as a nice spiritual uplifting means of entertainment. We have to start doing it like that if we're going to grow and become a successful ummah as was the early generations and the people. Superstition was at the heart of Arabia. Till now superstition is all over the place in the Muslim world. They use religion to make superstition. Somebody said one time, some, I don't know, somebody in my family was telling me, you have to take boiling water and put it down the drain so it will kill all the shayateen that are going to come out of there at you. All of the jinns are coming at you if you don't get that boiling water. <laughs> what are you talking about, right? I'm sure you heard this one. When you finish praying, flip over your corner of your rug so shaitan doesn't come pray on there. I like Azhar Osman. He said, shaitan needs to pray, man. He, if he's going to pray, he's the one who needs to be praying. <laughs> yeah. these, are, these are superstitions. Islam has no place. Islam is a beautifully, wisely, designed structure of life that is based upon pure divine decree and divine will with cause and effect based upon divine intervention and control right so this transformed Omar Omar had been told you what if the bird flies right when you let him go what if you throw the dart and it hits that part what if you go to this guy and he tells you I threw down the bones and it said this this was they were doing this this was Arabia Omar is now no كل شيء بقدر الله. Everything is happening on the plan of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. وأنا مسير وخل و ااا وميسر لما خلقت له. And I realized I was created for the purpose of doing His will, and so I will be made easy for that if I make my intentions in that direction. Right? This is the 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 understanding that Omar and the rest of the companions had. The issue of life. Life was terrestrial to the people of Arabia. It was terrestrial. This worldly life, that was it. You die, you become dust, that's it. How accountable? How will values and morals grow? How will ultimate justice be divided? There's all these people who've done many great things and pious things, but they weren't telling everybody about it. They were just doing this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? There were many people who did many Evil things. Nobody caught them. They were never punished, right? So, how, how is the ultimate justice? If God is just and we are responsible for knowing right and wrong, where, is, where does all that come together? So now they understood this. There's divine responsibility in this uh, reality that we live. So there's a hereafter. You will die, you will be resurrected, everybody will be judged for their choices and actions. Arabia was lawless tribalism. Lawless tribalism. We're talking about with the youth group. It's a natural question. One of the kids asked, it looks like the Prophet saw some of the companions went and robbed some caravans. That's what it looks like. Did that happen? Did the Prophet Muhammad saw some of his companions go rob Quraysh uh, caravans? Yes, they did. They did. Now everybody's having a moral dilemma with this. This doesn't sound right. This is not the Prophet of Mercy I'm seeing here. We have to deal with these things because our enemies, boy, this is on the top of their list about the proofs against Islam, right? They lived in a lawless society. No courts, no government, no means of justice. Their rights and wealth have been taken and depleted from them for three years in a row. Their wealth was taken, they were made to live in poverty and sub-poverty conditions, and now their new state that they formed is very much struggling to stay afloat. They need means. These people 
have oppressed them for no reason other than they said we believe in God as one entity of pure divine perfection and nobody else should be worshipped. That's all they said. But yet yeah, they deserved it. So they're taking their own right back because there is no system by which they can go to a court and say, force these people to give us our right. There's not, that doesn't exist. It's a lawless tribal society, right? Now, after Islam was fully revealed and there was a system, now nobody can do that because you have the system in place. You see what I'm saying? So you have to understand context before you rush to judgments about what happened because we don't want to judge that place like it was just this democratic society with a very good secure state of, of rights and so forth and freedom. No, that was not the case. So you had, they had to deal with the reality they lived in. So then, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُ بِالْعَدْلِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ وَإِتَاءِ ذِي الْقُرْبَى This ayah is revealed. Omar is hearing it. God commands to justice. Even-handed justice. Everybody is treated equally. If Muslim did something wrong, Muslim will be punished. My tribe did something wrong, I'm against that person in my tribe. Complete change of the fabric of society. This is changing Omar, right? This is changing how he sees things. So, now we've looked at these values, and we see these values. You have to ask yourself a question. Am I truly dedicated to these concepts and these values? And that's what I'm going to live the majority of my life and free time doing. Or am I just kind of associated with those values, accepting them as right? This is the question you have to ask yourself in life. This is what we came here to do. Do I have a daily agenda and purpose and focus to be dedicated to raising these values in the world around me? Or am I just saying those are good values and Jazakumullah khair for the ones who are working for it? This is the, this is the two different people within the Muslims. We need a lot of people that are working, activists, people that are actively working to make the world a better place. We just don't need people that are just associated with good values. The whole world, if you ask anybody out on the street about our values, those are good values. They will agree with you. They're, they probably aren't working for them. We should be, for sure. It should be us working for those things. Omar was working day and night. For Islam. Why did he become the great Omar? Because he was dedicated towards those values. Fixing himself, fixing the world around him, and being a person who makes a difference in the world. So guess what happened? Within the next year after Omar's Islam, the numbers of the Muslims went from about 40-50 to about 100-something. Doubles. And it's not just in Mecca, it's in surrounding tribes it's starting to grow. The Quraysh got together. They said, we have to do something. And they agreed upon the boycott. Let's sanction all Muslims. So now this is the new way. Before, tribes were saying, well, these Muslim people are in our tribe and we have a tribal system, so hands off. Now, Kufr is answering to what Iman has done. Islam set up the system that it is about <coughs> believers, regardless of tribe or nationality or wealth status or, or whatever. That didn't mean anything. To the Muslims it was a faith. Islam and faith, that is where we'll protect you and support you in that. Other than that, we will not support you and protect you. So Kufr finally said, okay, let's, we need to start arranging ourselves against them. So they said, now, disbelief is the standard by which we will stand and we will, so the Prophet ﷺ convinced them to uh, indirectly give up tribalism uh, unfortunately they decided the position of kufr to stand against it with so we have about five uh, ten minutes maybe um, Omar he comes to the point of immigration he's going to make his immigration Omar according to Ali ibn Abi Talib عنه, had a completely different experience than anyone else Every single companion from the Prophet to Abu Bakr to Uthman and all of them, they all had a special secret strategy of how to leave. There were certain people that had a plot on their necks or on their family or on their wealth where they were going to be majorly hit with a major fitna and problem if they did not plan very strategic. What did Omar do? The Prophet ﷺ informed him, I'm going to make my immigration to Medina. Everybody will go to Medina. We've been accepted there as the people of the state. It will be an Islamic state. So Omar says, okay. He goes home. He packs up his stuff. 
he gets his bow, he gets his arrows, he gets his sword, and he gets his staff. He comes out to the Kaaba and he tells everybody, listen up. If you want your kids to become orphans, and you want your wives to become widows, then no, I'm going on my immigration to Medina. So come and follow me and try to stop me if that's your uh, hopes. So some of the poor people in the week said, I'm rolling with him. <laughs> the poor Muslims was like, we're rolling with him, it's all good. This is the guy to be shotgun. I'm in the front seat with him. This is the person you want to go with. Omar also took many of his family members and he invited his two close friends. Right? Omar said to his friends, he says, Ayyash ibn Rabi'ah and Hisham ibn al-As. He told them, look, meet me around the way. I'm going to go through this area first. We'll meet there. If one of us doesn't show, this is the command of the Prophet Wasallam. We hear and we obey. We will move on. And if the other one had something happen to him. So Omar has his group and they go by that spot. And Ayash is waiting there with him. And they wait for Hisham al-As and he does not come. So we have to leave. We don't know what happened to him. God bless him. We got to go. So they go. And they travel on their journey in peace and comfort. There's about 25 of them. Omar's crew. They're just going on their immigration. So they get to Medina. And guess who meets them there shortly thereafter? Abu Jahl and the family members of Ayyash. Hmm? They come and they say, uh, Listen, Ayyash, I spoke with your mom. Your mom is sad. She's in complete disgust that you would leave her. I thought your Muslim values said you have to honor your mom. Yeah. She has said, and this is what this is that some strange culture. I will not brush my hair and I will not take shade from the sun until you come back. So Omar he says, Don't listen to these guys. They are messing with your head. Not anything they say is true. We don't trust a hair on their head. If your mom starts getting lice eating your head, she's going to brush her hair and wash it. If your mom is out in the hot sun in Mecca, she's fixing to take shape. Know that. Please don't let this guy get to you. And they said, no, no, no. I'm telling you, your mom is crying. She's starving herself. It's very difficult. Ayash said, it is Islam. I owe my mother. I need to go back there and take her contentment. Omar said, no, this is a plot by polytheists. You should not listen to them no matter what they say. He said, no, I have to go. Omar said, look, I'm one of the most wealthy Muslims, okay? I'll give you half of my wealth if you'll just stay here. Aya said, no, I'm going to go take care of my mother. So then Omar said, okay, if you're going to go, I'm going to give you this real good camel I have. This camel is fast and easy to control, and she listens on the drop of a dime. You go on. If they start acting shady and strange, then immediately come back. Because you don't trust these people. You should not trust these people. His family members are with Abu Jahl. They said, we're not here about this whole, this thing, your mama is very upset and sick over this. You have to take her contentment. So they go on their journey. And they go, and they stop, the first stop. Ayash gets down, all comfortable, no big deal, go get some water, and then boom, they pounce on him and tie him up. Omar was right. So then, they put him on the back of the camel. Let's go. We're going to take you to Mecca, and the Quraysh will judge you. And so as he's going, he's trying to tell them, listen, this is not fair, and all of this. He said, no, you're with these people who've corrupted our society, and all of this. And so we're going to see what you, you know. So they take Ayash back to his mom. His mom pleads and pleads and pleads. They start to threaten torture. Ayash turned on Islam. He, 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 he released himself from faith and said, I am now a polytheist again. And he lost his way. The news came back to Omar and Omar was devastated. That was his close friend. And he was happy to bring him into the fold of Islam. And so he told the companions. And he's narrating the story and he said, We used to say, if anyone would know God through the Qur'an and then they would reject that, God will never accept repentance or forgiveness for them ever again, no matter what they do. We used to say that. And people started to say that about Ayyash. The Prophet ﷺ came and we told him what happened. And the Prophet ﷺ recited the following ayahs. 
أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم قل يا عبادي الذين أسرفوا على أنفسهم لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم وأنيبوا إلى ربكم وأسلموا له من قبل أن يأتيكم من قبل أن يأتيكم من العذاب ثم لا تنصرون so this ayah is revealed and it says, Say to all of my servants, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing everyone, all my servants, who have done major wrong against their souls, do not despair or be hopeless of the mercy of God. He forgives all sins. He forgives all sins. He is the truly forgiving and merciful. Turn back to your Lord and make full submission to His will before the day comes that you could be punished and you will have no way out from that. So what it's saying here is before death, no matter what you've done, shirk, polytheism, kufr, hypocrisy, major sins, turn back to Him. Seek His forgiveness. Try to reconcile and, and reform your life. And He will forgive you open-handedly and completely forget and erase whatever happened before. This is the nature of Allah SWT. <coughs> Omar became, Omar's crying. Omar then thought, he wrote down the ayah. He wrote down the ayah on a piece of paper. And he sent a courier. Go to Mecca and find Ayash ibn Rabi'ah or Hisham ibn al-As. And give them this paper. Because they both turn to shirk. Hisham ibn al-As, he gets the paper. He says, this is from Omar. He said, I read the paper 10-15 times. And it sounded nice, but I didn't get it. So then he said, he prayed. He prayed and sujood. Help me to understand this. And then he immediately realized that this is God talking to him. Telling him, I am not going to curse you. Unless you choose to live the rest of your life like this. Turn back right now and I'll forget whatever it was that you're doing. Hisham left everything. All of the people in his family, polytheists, jumped on his uh, horse with all of his stuff and went to Medina as a muhajir, a mu'min. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad rasulullah. This is the beauty of faith. This is the beauty of the ayat of the Qur'an. Omar could have said, he could have wrote many letters. Listen guys, I, you didn't listen to me. I told you, don't go with these guys back. And look what happened to you. But Omar realized it's not about him. It's not me and you and what I thought and my opinion. It is the reality of your heart. In the Quran, shifa'u lima sudur. It is a cure for that which is within the hearts. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide our hearts and help us to reform ourselves and facilitate for us <coughs> these holy divine concepts of creed, belief, character, and worship, and structure of life so that we may be successful in this life and in the hereafter, inshallah. Is there any question?